Which war did you serve in and what branch of the service? World War II. I was in the Marine Fighter Squadron. VMF 323 Death Rattlers. VMF? VMF 323. The V is like heavier than air. M is for Marine. F is Fighter. Squadron 323. We were called the Death Rattlers. Why were you called that? Well, that was a very interesting thing. When we were at uh, Camp Pendleton, I believe it was Camp Pendleton, and uh, we had a pilot in our outfit who uh, did photography and things like that. Well, they found a snake in off, off one of the runways there one day, and uh, somebody came up with the idea, well, let's call ourselves the Death Rattlers. It's a true story. It's a true story. And do they still use that name? That, the, 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 the people that are in the, the people that are in the squadron today still, well, let me put it this way. VMF 323 up to, to this day is still in commission. I don't know. I, the last I heard, they were on an aircraft carrier. I don't know how true that is. Or they were either at, uh, some airfield in California. Were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted. Where were you living at the time? On Freeman Street in Hartford, Connecticut. Why did you enlist? Well, ever since I was a, a little guy, I always thought the Marines were, I was always very proud of the Marine Corps. So that's why you picked the Marines as that, opposed to one of the other branches? That is correct. Do you recall your first days in service? Well, Where did you go for your induction? Uh, Springfield, Massachusetts. I first went to the post office in Hartford, then from there, Springfield, Mass. And, from the, and then from there, Paris Island, South Carolina. Did you go home in between or did you go to Paris Island immediately after induction? Uh, no. Right after I was put in the Marine Corps, they had hotel rooms in Springfield, and we stayed there, and then from there we shipped out. And you went to Paris Island for your basic training? That is correct. How long was that? I believe that was for three months, or more, yeah, three or four months. And what was basic training like? It was tough, very tough. Very tough. What did you do? Well, they, they had march all day long. And, and uh, one, partic one particular incident, I forget, is I got quite a kick out of it. They said, we're going to go get our rifles today. See, we, when you first go in, you don't have any any weapons at all. Later on, after, after you train a while, then they they had give you weapons to get. So they marched to the uh, where the weapons were. And we were handed the weapons, and I couldn't believe it. They were all so greasy, it was unbelievable, you just about hold them. And the sergeant said, don't anybody ever drop one of those rifles, or you'll be doing plenty of push-ups. <laughs> and there we are, and we had a march, I would say, close to a mile with those rifles the way they were. Could just about hold on, it was just <laughs> unbelievable. Wow. <laughs> Do you remember any of your instructors from basic training? No, I don't, no. It's, it's been so long ago, I really don't. They were good, though. Very, very good. Very good. So you received good training there? Yes, I did. After your basic training at Paris Island, where did you go to? After my basic training at Paris Island, I was put in a, an outfit, a line company outfit. You know, that's like infantry. And I was in that outfit only a short while. We were at New River. They, that's what they called it. I don't know what they, today they call it Camp Lejeune. When I was, when I was there, we called it New River. Well, anyway, they was there. Then one day, my name was called off. And I was told that I was going to be put in gliders. And I was going to be shipped to Paris Island again. But there's an airfield on Paris Island called Page Field. So, I went there, and I'm in gliders. Gliders like in the sky? Yeah. Gliders, yep, and a glider outfit. So now well, I'm in that outfit a while, and then we we went to Texas. 
And while we were in Texas, we got the word that they were going to break up gliders. See, I think they they realized that gliders wouldn't be much good in the Pacific. If you're going overshoot an island, it's going to be tough to get back, you know, <laughs> with, with a glider. You know, maybe you haven't got the, the you know, the, the wind effect or whatever. They Well, anyway, they thought it would be best if they did away with gliders in the Marine Corps. And when they did away with gliders in the Marine Corps, that is when I was sent to Cherry Point, North Carolina, and here's this new fighter squadron being formed. Cherry Point, North Carolina? Yeah, North Carolina, yeah. And here's this new fighter squadron being formed. VMF 323. And I was one of the first guys in that Marine Fighter Squadron, which, like we said, still in commission today. I could actually show you the picture of the, uh, our insignia. Yes, later, and we'll include that with yeah. your record. Yeah, it's very, very, it's a very, very nice insignia. Now, when they decided to put you in the glider outfit, did, had you had any training or background with airplanes? No. No, did none have, at all. Did you have a choice in that, or they just decided they were going to No, they're going to put you in, then they train you. Then they train you. That's how I began to work on engines of airplanes and stuff, because, see, they had airplanes, you know, they were going to be, they were going to tow these gliders. And, you know, we, we, that's where I began to work on engines of airplanes. Now, you did receive some training in the glider uh, outfit before they broke it up? Well, the... Not too much because they, they didn't. The liner gliders didn't exist long in, long in the Marine Corps. I mean, I, I I have the distinction I would say of being one of the one of the only one of a maybe three hundred fellows to were ever in gliders in the history in the Marine Corps. Wow! I mean, they had a glider outfit for a very short while. There's only about three or four hundred of us in it, and that was it. And the history. So if you check back in the whole history of the Marine Corps. That was it. And they were training you to be a mechanic on the aircraft? Yes. When you went to Cherry Point, how long did you train there? Approximately. You mean the, uh, with the... Because now they, you know, they sent you to Cherry Point and put you in that... The VMF 323, yeah. Right. Oh, then we, well, when we went there, they put me in this outfit. I was, see, when we went to Cherry Point, we were all put in this particular barracks, all the guys who were in the gliders. And then so many were picked for this squadron that was being formed. So many were picked in another squadron and so on and so forth. And uh, I, was, uh, I was there for a while before I was put in VMF 323. And they would give me duty once in a while to go down to the airfield and bring planes in and out before I was put in VMF 323. And that's where I had the distinction. And up to this day, I believe it was Charles A. Lindbergh that came in one day. And I had the distinction of bringing him in. And uh, I believe it was, I, I, I'm pretty sure it was him. <laughs> up to this day, it's been so long, but I'm pretty sure it was him. And, what uh, do you mean by bringing him in? Well, he, when he lands, he comes in on the airfield. Then he, then you have to bring, then he has to go into a certain area. Then he to, taxis the plane into a certain area. So that's where I was bringing certain planes in this particular area, where there was other areas where they had a report. Somebody else would bring them in their area, and uh, and then one day I was picked with a few other guys. That there was a new squadron being formed, VMF 323, and I was put in there. And then from Cherry Point, we went to Pollocksville, and so on and so. Pollocksville, North Carolina. It's only outside of Cherry Point. Oh. Yeah. And what did you do there? Well, there we trained and trained and trained. And, uh, and what I, were they training you specifically? Well, I worked on the air, and I worked. I worked on the airplanes. As a mechanic. Yeah. Had you had any previous mechanic experience before you joined the Marines? No, no. Well, I, I, I when I was in the gliders, I worked on some of the uh, some some engines, you know some airplanes, and I learned a little there. And then when I went to VMS 323, of course, they had the better guys that had more experience. And I, you know, it was like their assistants, you know, you know, like a backup to them. 
I was not one of the top men. I was like a backup to them. And uh, and we worked on the engines, and then finally we got that F4U come in. And uh, from there we trained and trained and trained. And How many men were in your squadron? There's about 300 in the Marine Fighter Squadron. That's all. It's only about 300. Now, did you stay with this same squadron for the rest of the war? That is correct. From the day I was put in right to the day I got out, the war ended. And was it the same group of men? Uh, right, I would say yes, right up to the end, the same group of fellows, yep. All right, so after your training, um, where did you go next? You mean after we left the States? Yep. Well, when did you hear that you were leaving the States and going overseas? Well, we got the, uh, we got the word one day we were going to be shipping out. Did you know where you were going? No, they wouldn't tell you anything. This had to be, all to be kept quiet. We were put on this aircraft carrier. A baby aircraft carrier. Do you remember the name? No, I, I can't remember the name. No, I, gee, I wish I did. I, I had it I had it in mind up until a few years ago, and then I forgot. I forgot the name of this aircraft carrier, and it dropped us off at Hawaii, Oahu. There was an airfield there, and our pilots did some training there. And then we got the word. From there, we are going somewhere else. And, uh, gee, boy, it's hard to remember, hard to remember. Uh, well, we, we stopped at quite a few different islands, but finally we got, finally, uh, I don't know how it worked. I forgot when. Some guys, see, I was put what they call the second echelon. They had the first echelon. The first group went on the LSD, LSD or whatever. And them are the ones that went to the Okinawa before we did. Then we followed them in about two or three weeks later. Now, you went right from Oahu, Hawaii to Okinawa? Nope. We, um, we were supposed to, from what I understand, we were supposed to have been going into some other island that got hit, was getting hit. But... They didn't need us there, so we ended up going to another island, which I can't think of the name of it. We then we stayed there for a while and did more training. Then we got the word from there that we were going to Okinawa. So we had, a, like I said, we had a group that went out on an LS, LST. Then I was put on this troop ship, and we met our... We met the first group about two weeks later at Okinawa. Wait, um, what's the date at this point? Do you remember what year that was? Yeah, this would be 1945. What year did you enlist? I enlisted in 1942. Okay, so you were in the 1942nd. Did you know you were headed to Okinawa or not until you got there? They kind of give us a hint that we were going to Okinawa. You're right. You know, it's unbelievable. That place was hit Easter morning, April the 1st, Easter morning. Easter fell April the 1st that year, 1945. But like I said, I was not one of the first guys in. So what was the date when you're... Oh, when I went in? Yep. Oh, about two weeks later, three weeks so later. it was two weeks after the battle. Yeah, began. something like two or three weeks later, yeah. And you were in a squadron of fighter planes? That's right. And what was their mission on Okinawa? Uh, well, to keep those Japs away from all of them, to keep the, those Japs away from the uh, our fleet, which was out there, our Navy. Yep. Do you remember landing at Okinawa and what it was like? Well, when we landed at Okinawa, I mean, it, it was very quiet, very quiet. We went in, didn't hear anything. Like I said, I see. I went in two weeks later, three weeks later, mm -hmm. and uh, but from what I understand, it was very quiet going in. Then after you got in there, then everything, you know, then you would see some action. But in, you know, it was very quiet going in. But we used to get uh, 
Jap planes coming over at night, things like that. And there was a lot of snipers around. But I was very lucky. Never got touched. There was a Marine uh, airfield on Okinawa? That is correct. Yeah, Kadena. Oh, I believe it was called Kadena Airfield. And how long did you stay on Okinawa? Oh, gee, let's see now. I forgot. I was there. What if the papers show that record? I don't know. Well, we can we can check later. Okay. Um, was it more like days or weeks or months? I was there a few months. Yeah, right to the end of the war. Oh, so you stayed on Okinawa then until the end of the yeah, war? Yeah, to the end of the war. Now I got news for you. I got close. I come close to getting killed at the end of the war. Everybody's going nuts, shooting the rifles off. The war is over. The war is over, and they and then I mean. Of course, everybody was so excited they didn't realize how dangerous that was. <laughs> so they were shooting their guns in celebration? Yeah, in celebration, yeah. Wow. <laughs> they were so happy the war ended. Now, while you were serving on Okinawa, what was your specific duties? Were you a mechanic on the airplane? Yeah, yeah. I worked for one of the main mechanics, you know, like a backup to him, helping him out. And what was your typical work day like? Well, we were down there, worked on the planes. When they would come in, you gas them up. Then his work had to be done. You did that, and get getting them ready for another, another cap. You know, command air patrol. And uh, I might add that I think, well, when you take a look at the documentary, you're going to be very, very surprised that uh, VMF 323 Death Rattlers were one of the. Uh, Great squadrons in the Marine Corps. I mean, Pappy Boynton and all those fellows there, well, they were over there twice, and they had quite a number of planes they shot down. But we were there, and in seven weeks, in seven weeks' time, our pilots shot down 124 and a half Japanese airplanes in seven weeks. And we ended up, that was a record, and we ended up with like 15 aces in our squadron. Fifteen pilots that had five or more planes. That was another record. I mean, it was just unbelievable. This is just seeing combat once. And uh, it's in the documentary, and it, it's unbelievable. Now, would you typically work just uh, like an eight-hour day, a ten-hour day, a twelve-hour day? What time did you get up, or how long did you work? Well, you never knew. You never knew. It all depends. You know how the planes, what the planes were, and how much work had to be done. You know, you did, you just did your job until it was complete, regardless of how many hours. I mean, you had some guys there, and I'm telling you, they, we had some guys there, some great mechanics in our squadron. I was not considered one of the. Those guys had different schooling than I did. They were considered top shelf, and uh, those guys, uh, they just continued to work from morning till night on those planes. Sometimes, yep. Did you see combat? Yeah, well, we, well, like I said, we had a few planes that would come over at night, Jap planes that would come over at night, night fighters come over and give us a hard time. Then we had a guy that would bomb us every, shell us every once in a while. We called him Pistol Pete. He, <laughs> this is a good one. Pistol Pete would open up on us. I mean, they, told me, they always told me how smart the Japs were, but I could never understand why Pistol Pete would open up on a, the same hour every day because we'd all look at each other. Well, it's almost that time. Let's go to the foxhole. I mean, why, you know, if he changed around, he could fool us. But he always did on the same time. And the, and the way they found out where he was located, so he was in a cave. And the only way I think, from, what, from the way the story goes, they finally nailed him. Because the woman that he was with was pregnant, and she needed help. She was going to have a baby, and this is how we finally caught him. I know that's the story I got. I thought I thought it was pretty good. <laughs> so, other than Pistol Pete, um, was there any other action? Yeah, those night fighters give you a hard time at night. Yeah, with and then, then you would have. Then you had during the daytime, you'd have 
a couple of Japs would break through and, you know, strafe the airfield and stuff like that. Did yeah. you have any casualties in your unit? We had, we lost two or three guys. But they were accidents where, uh, you know, like, I think one guy chopped, got chopped up by a, by a propeller and stuff like that, you know. But I don't think we lost anybody. In combat? In combat, you know. You know, the island was pretty well secured. The Marine the infantry had that island pretty well preserved where, you know, we didn't get bothered too much. At the, at the, I mean, at the beginning it was tough. You know, but I wasn't there at the beginning, but it was tough for what I understand. When they first took the island. Were you awarded any medals or citations? Yes, but I don't know what they were. <laughs> <laughs> Was your unit awarded any medals or citations? Yes. But yeah. Don't know what they are. yeah, I don't know what they are, but yeah. Yeah. I'm going to ask you a couple questions about daily life. Yeah, that 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 thing I showed you might show it that their lineage might show all that. How did you stay in touch with family while you were overseas? We would write. Yeah, we write. Yeah. How was the mail service? Very good. Very good. And what was the food like? Oh, you know what? I'm glad you asked that question. We had a fellow by the name of Mayor. Now, I'm going to tell you something. This fellow was something else. He was really sharp. He would go to the, all the all the ships, at, you know, that were anchored off off Okinawa, and he would bring in souvenirs, bring souvenirs to them, and they would give him some food that was unbelievable. Now he was our our uh, head man in the in the, at the mess hall. You know, officer mayor, lieutenant mayor, and I'm going to tell you, he fed us like kings. He would always go down there to, uh, and, and those Navy guys and bring some souvenirs to him. And then they had to bring back food. And it was unbelievable. And then, and then I'll sh later on you'll see a picture of the mess hall that we had. And up there it had VMF 323 death rattles, the short iron signia, with 125, 124 flags. And Mayor, Mayor's mess were the aces meat to eat. And all now, and we got such a reputation, Eileen. This is unbelievable. Now, without exaggerating, Army fellows, Navy fellows, Marines from all over that island, which is about fifteen, which is big island, about sixty miles long and fifteen miles wide, came and would take pictures all day long of that mess hall, where Mayor's mess meet to eat. Because he got to be so popular, and we got to be so popular, that people from all over the island came there. So you were fed very well, huh? Oh, you Mayor's... Three meals a day? Yes, and Mayor, he died not... From what I understand, he only died about a month ago. Really? How do you spell his last name? Mayor? Is it M-A-H-E-R? M-E-Y-E-R or something like that. that. Yeah, Mayor. Yeah, a Jewish boy. Very good. Boy, he was great. Fed us like kings. How they did it, I don't know. <laughs> did you have sufficient amount of supplies? Food? No, not so much. Well, food and also um, clothing, weapons, equipment oh. you needed for the planes. The planes? Yes. Uh, the make, like I told you about those mechanics we had, where they got those parts, I don't know, but they would always end up getting parts somewhere. <laughs> yep, unbelievable. How about things like clothing and and food? Did you have sufficient supplies? Oh, that? plenty of food. Yes, mayor's mess. Plenty of food. So really, there wasn't anything you wanted for. No, nope. we. I don't know how. I mean, like I said, it. I mean, a lot of people just can't believe it. There was an exceptional. The Death Rattles was an exceptional squadron. Unbelievable. How we got all this food. Do you think and, that's why you were treated so well, or were all the squadrons treated that well? All the squadrons were treated well, but you know, every squadron has somebody that can do that little something, you know, extra. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. The mayor's mess. Mayor, I don't know how the hell he did it, but <laughs> he ended up feeding us like kings. 
Did you feel any pressure or stress on the job? Well, you, you got to, you, you know, sometimes, you know, you, gotta, you were a little tired, yeah. And how did you feel <coughs> the stress when you felt it? Okay, no problem. Was there anything special that you did for good luck? Not that I recall, no. And what did you do for entertainment? Well, during, well, during the war, you do, while you were on Okada, you, did, you didn't do much for entertainment. You just, you know, did your duty and then went back to your tent. And, you know, and when, the, when the planes came in, you would meet them and get them ready for next time around, next time out, you know. See, every squadron, there was more than one squadron on the island, you know, more than one Marine fighter squadron. And uh, they all had different duty. Every squadron had different duty to do. In other words, uh, in, our, in our particular case, like I said, we shot our, our pilot shot down 124 and a half. And we just happened to be in the right place at the right time. In other words, uh, when our planes would go up and take over so another squadron could leave, we were, you know, the Japs would be coming in. And then when some other squadron would be up there, maybe the Japs would never come in. So when you were there at the right time, you would be able to shoot down a few and, and make yourself a reputation. How often would your squadron go up? Did they have any kind of a schedule where you'd oh, go yeah. up one day and then have three days off or anything? No, no, no. You, they, 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 they had to go up every day just about, yeah. So every day you were repairing whatever. Yeah, yeah. Was. yeah. There was a schedule every. There was a schedule that that the every Marine fighter squadron had. See, we were at Kadena. Then uh, there was another. There was another airfield on the island also. <coughs> I forgot the name of that one, but the one we were at was Kadena. How many? Squadrons I think I'm pretty sure that was it. Do you I might have even. How many squadrons were there with you? No, I don't. No. I think there was about two or about three. There was yeah. three thirteen. I think three thirteen was with us. We were three twenty three. I think three thirteen. Gee, I, I I really don't remember to tell you the truth. I mean, I I should have looked. I should have looked at that documentary. Oh, that's okay, that's all right. We'll check it out later. Uh, did you see any USO shows while you were over there? No, I didn't see any. No. Did any come to Kadena while you were there? I don't recall that either. Did you have any leave time while you were overseas? No, not not when you're not when you're overseas. You don't. Not unless you go to an island that that's not in combat or anything. Then there you have more a little more freedom. You know what I mean? Right. Like when we were to Oahu and uh, and a couple of other different islands, we stopped off at for a few days. You know. Did you have leave when you were at those places? Oh no, you don't go. You don't. You can't go anywhere. Oh, so you there's didn't nowhere to go. Travel anywhere else while no, you there, there's there. nowhere. No, there's nowhere. What? When you're overseas, there's just there's nowhere to go. Not unless you were in, a, in the Atlantic, but uh, in the Pacific, there's just, just not anywhere to go. Do you recall any particularly humorous or unusual event? Not really. No. What did you think of the officers? Very good. We had very good. We had one officer from Connecticut, Gus Broberg. He was a basketball player. He played at Torrington High. And then he went on to, uh, I forgot what college it was, and he was an All-American basketball player. The name was Gus Broberg. And uh, he had a very... He had... Um, there's a guy that had a big future for him in basketball. But he was on a mission one day, and he got shot up pretty bad. And when he came back to the base, I guess he couldn't just, you know, the plane was pretty much out of control. And he he went into a, an embankment. And from what I understand, they had to amputate his arm after. So... Uh, and this is this uh, Lieutenant Gus Roberg? Gus Roberg, yeah. Did that end his basketball career? I would say I would say it did, yeah. From what I understand, he's in Florida right now, and he is a uh, he's in Florida, and he, he uh, I don't know, he must 
Well, he must be retired now. Yeah. I got a picture of him here. In the... Do you remember any of the other officers? Oh, yes. Then it was... Um... Well, we had our commanding officer. Now, I'm going to... This one is a good one. Our commanding officer, Major Axtell, while I was with him. His name was Major Axtell. He put together the... Can I get up for a second? To no. get the got the men home? Oh. <laughs> he he put our squadron together. It tells that whole documentary I have tells about how three hundred guys were put together and they trained and trained and trained and went into combat. Now Major Axtell was also an ace. He was one of the aces in the squadron. And not only that, he put something like thirty two years in the United States Marine Corps and ended up as a three star general. And he was your CO? He was my major, he was our, my commanding officer in VMA 323. Wow. He ended up as a major, he ended up as a, I'll give you his number after, maybe you could call him. <laughs> uh, what other, I think I have it. What other officers can you recall? Then there was Jerry O'Keefe. He oh. is a, he's a big time, in fact, he, he's going to hold a reunion shortly, but I don't think I'll be able to get there. Because of my problem, because of Mary's problem, because of my problem and Mary's problem, and uh, is going to hold a reunion. It was supposed to have it not too long ago, but then they had that. Uh, he's from Biloxi, and that's where they had that big uh, hurricane. Hurricane, so they had to call it off. Now it's going to have it again. Now, what was his rank? He was a. Uh, I don't know if he made captain or not. He was a lieutenant. He was an ace also. Yeah, Jerry O'Keefe. He owns a big, big, a big um, insurance company in Malaxi, Mississippi. He owns a big insurance company. Then you had, uh, oh, gee, it's hard for me to remember all these names, but we had so many guys I remember. I remember them all. I remember just about all of them. What did you think of your fellow Marines? Lot, uh, we, 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 were, we were one great clique. I mean... We stuck together like Lou. We were very close. And you stayed with that same group of men for the entire time. That is correct. That's why we're, yeah, we were very close. Major Axe still did a very great a great job. Did you form uh, any close friendships with fellow Marines? Yeah, there was a couple I did. Yep, very close. Uh, Chigogi, he passed away. E.J. Stevens, I don't know what happened to him. Roger Archambault. And right down the line... A guy by the name of Magliocco, Frank Magliocco. He was, I would say that Frank Magliocco, without exaggerating, was one of the top mechanics in our squadron. Magliocco, another one called Hitchings, another one called Finney. Those those guys were really could work on any airplane that they were that they were showed. Frank Did Magliocco. You stay in touch with him after the war. Oh yeah, I still call Magliocco up once in a while. We still associate with each other. And he lives right in Connecticut. Yeah, he lives in Columbia. <coughs> he, he was, huh? And that's very close. Yeah, he was very good. He was one of the top mechanics in the squadron. <coughs> Do you recall any memorable experiences while you were on Okinawa? Oh, it's in a documentary. You want me to tell you about it? Yes. Well, uh, one day we're being these planes were we're being bombed. And we all ran to the foxhole. And somebody hollered out, Gas! Gas! And everybody got excited and ran because during this whole war, during, up to this day, never heard of any, the word gas in this war. Well, anyway, it, <coughs> finally somebody said, <coughs> Relax, it's not gas. So everybody forgot me. What it was was when the bombs dropped and exploded, they let off a smell that was so bad it was unbelievable. And somebody somebody got a little nervous and yelled out gas. And everybody got a... I mean, you know, nobody had the right, the proper equipment to, to protect yourself from gas or anything. And uh, it was so just... It was a little bit of a panic. Oh, yeah, everybody got scared when gas, you know, that stuff there do away with you just like that. 
That was a, that, I told that one in the documentary, though, and I told a little story. Now, do you recall where you were when you heard that the war was over? Because you were still on Okinawa when the war ended. Yeah, I was on Okinawa, yeah. And what were you doing when you got the news? I think I was at, I was, I think it was at the airfield doing something. I don't know just what. I think it was with Frank Magliocco, and uh, we got the war. The word the war was over, and that's when uh, we, we thought we'd have to run for a foxhole. When everybody went wild, which I don't, you know, which, which you know, you know, can't blame went away. But when you start shooting those those rifles, you know, it, it, it got dangerous. Um, how long did you continue on on Okinawa before they shipped you home? Uh, oh, I think I was there about, I would say close to a couple of weeks, three weeks before uh, I got replaced. And what did you do in that period of time? Nothing. Took it easy. Took it easy. Then, I, then when I got replaced, I was put on the U.S., the, the, would you believe it, the York, the Yorktown, the, York, the Fighting Lady. It was a big aircraft area. Took took me home. The USS Yorktown. Yeah, I think it was called the Yorktown. Yeah, big the Fighting Lady. They made quite a, that that ship made quite a reputation for itself. How long did the uh, journey home take? Well, I don't recall. Did your whole squadron go home together? Oh no 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 no. A little broke a little at a time. And where did you land once you had the United States? Oh, wait a minute. Did well, you stop in Hawaii on your way home? No, we can't, went right, we went right, Sam, I can't think of the, isn't that something, geez, how you forget? Well, in Frisco, San Francisco, somewhere, I forgot where. Oh, so you landed in San Francisco? Yeah. And were you discharged immediately? Oh, no, 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 then from there we had to go to Maryland. How did you get to Maryland? Train. A civilian train or a troop train? I think it was a troop train. And where did you go in Maryland? Uh, I think I got the name of the base, but that's where I got discharged from. So then you yeah. were discharged yeah. from Maryland? Yeah. Well, you want me to look at the paperwork there? No, we, we can oh. check it because I know you have your discharge papers. So you were discharged, and how did you get home from Maryland? I took a train. What did you do in the days and the weeks immediately following the war once you were discharged and home? I did nothing much. Nothing much. Well, I can tell you a little story, I mean, with my discharge. See, I was going to college before the war. I went to Hilliard College. <clears throat> and for some reason, I don't know why, I just didn't think I was ready for school, so I left. And I, en and I enlisted in the Marine Corps. Now, I come home. You don't forget, when I was going to school, this was during the, not much money around. You know, like, you know, things are still tough. So this is an incident I will never forget as long as I live. I came home, and a couple of weeks went by, maybe three weeks, and my father was, said to me one day, well, he said, Al, he said, look, are you ready to go back to school now? Now that the war is over, ready to go back to school? I said, no, I don't think so. I said, I have a good job lined up. I think I'll take that and forget about it. He looked at me, and he went like this. When I had to pay, you went to college. When I had to pay and there was no money around, today you can go free and you don't go. I went, oh, brother, I could never forget that, which he was right. I mean, here he is coming up with this money during the, more or less during the Depression, the same in college, and now that I can go for free, I don't go. So you didn't go? He no, didn't I didn't never went you? back. No, I went back. I went to night school and I went to night school and a couple of things like that. At Hillier? No, at um, on Washington Street. What was the name of that there? Uh, that's oh my God, 
you know, where you learn how to be a... Was it, it was a school there in, on Washington Street. I went there. Where you learn how to be what? Well, I learned how to do your estimating and stuff like that. And did you go to school, night school on the GI Bill? No, no, I just went there. It was freebie. Oh. Now, you said you had a job lined up. What was the job you had lined up? Well, see, I, when I, I, I worked with my father for a while, who was a carpenter. He was a builder. And I learned quite a bit from him. And I, I, got, I got a job. Captain City Lumber called me up one day and asked me if I wanted to go on the road. So I went on the road for them. Capital was, City Lumber? Yeah. I went on the road for them. They were in, then they liquidated. And uh, General Building Supply called me up, which is in East Hartford. I went to work for them. I put 25 years in. Today they're still they're still in business today, but they sold out to. Now it's called Hugh Hubbard General Building or something like that, but uh, they're still in business. I was with them on the road for them for 25 years. Wow. Did you join any veterans organizations? Well, I I I I, I went it. I never got into that stuff too much. I I went into v, a v, a VMF. What was it? Uh, American Legion and the other one. What's the other one? VMF. VFW. VFW. I was in there for a short while and then got out. I I, ne I never got too uh, too tied up in any of those. You did join the American Legion though. But very short while. Oh, yeah. Both of them. Yeah, both of them. Very short while. Are you in any veterans organization? Nothing. Nothing. Now? Nothing. You know, I mean, it, it might sound crazy to, I just never got that deep into all this stuff. I mean, uh, I've been in close to four years in the Marine Corps, and I did my thing, met a lot of nice guys, and when it was over, I packed it in. I didn't want to, it didn't make a, a big issue about it, you know what I mean? And you went on with your life, and I know that at some point you got married and had children. That's right, I had two children. A boy, boys. a boy and a girl. I had a son that uh, put 25 years in the Marine Army Reserves and 25 years with the uh, state police. And I have a daughter that also went to college. And uh, she teaches here in, in Glastonbury at Special Ed at Norbrook School. That's Melissa's mother. <laughs> Did your military experience influence your thinking about war? Big part? Did your military experience influence your thinking about war? I, I don't know what you mean about that now. The time that you spent in the military, did that have an effect on how you feel about war? Did that influence you at well, all? I, well, I just, just like many other guys, I, I, was, I said, well, I, I, I hope this is the end. Meaning forever, but as you know, with what's going on today, I was completely wrong. Do you attend any reunions? Now I know you told me before that that your squadron, the VMF three twenty three, has had reunions. Yes. How often do they have reunions? Once a year, once every two years. Wow. So how many of you? Attended? I went to about two of them, one in Boston and one in Washington. They were very nice. One in Boston was unbelievable. A guy by the name of Muse ran it. He was a, he was an officer, also a pilot, and he shot down a couple of planes. But I don't know if he was an ace or not. <clears throat> but he lives in Boston today, and his name is Bob Muse. M U S C Muse. He put on a reunion. It was unbelievable. I mean, he had hotel rooms for us. He had at his house. So his wife was a judge, also, and so. She was a lawyer also, and they put on quite a show. And uh, then they had buses escorting us here, there, and everywhere. And people on the streets, everybody had to stop for us. To, you know, all our squad was on his bus. It was unbelievable. How did your military experience affect your life? Well, it made me very proud of myself. To be in the Marine Corps and doing, you know, hey, look, I consider myself an American and I did all I could and I was quite proud to have been in the Marine Corps and in the war to help. 
I mean, you you know, you you know what I'm trying to say. I don't I don't know if I'm wording this correctly or not, but I felt so good that I did my part. Is there anything else that you'd like to add that we haven't covered in this interview so far? I think that uh, I think we did pretty good. I mean, I any I, other stories or incidents that you can remember? Uh, not that I know of right offhand. Not that I know of offhand. There's a lot of stories. You had a lot of stories, but I could, I just can't think of any right now. I mean, a lot of stories. Can't think of any right now. And do you have photographs to accompany this record? Well, I got do you the have pictures of some of the guys. Yeah, and the documentary. And this, okay. Yeah. Well, Alfred, I'd like to thank you for your service to our country, and thank you for letting me interview you. Well, it was a pleasure having you, Eileen.